Many people marvel at the allure of winemaking. This show was meant to give you a sneak peek behind the curtain with an exclusive view of what goes into the magic of making a bottle. Come with me as we explore local wineries, meet the vintners, and experience wines from all over the world. My name is Raquel Mullaney. Welcome to Uncorked. Hello everyone, welcome to Uncorked. I'm so excited to have a very special guest today, Robert Mullaney, who is the winemaker for the 1620 Winery. Welcome, Robert. Thank you. So, I think we should have full disclosure that he is my husband, <laughs> and we do own the 1620 Winery together, but there's a really cool story behind how we actually got into winemaking, and I would love it if you would tell the story. Well, I've been making wine most of my life, my grandfather was from Sicily. He was a winemaker. I kind of grew up with it. Um, and then when we sold our home healthcare company, we uh, saw the old Plymouth Winery, which is the original winery started in 75 here in Plymouth, for sale. And we decided um, that that would be our next venture. So Speaking for myself, I know that I was very scared when you looked at the ad and you looked at me and said, would you like to do this? So were you scared to jump into winemaking professionally as a career, leaving healthcare behind? I don't know if I was scared, but um, it's, it's a challenge just like healthcare was. Didn't know anything about that when we started. So what did you do to make the transition from making wine in your basement to making 10,000 gallons of Chardonnay and standing in this beautiful barrel room today? Uh, we hired a wine consultant, a guy named Marco from, he run, owns Trevessier Winery in uh, New Bedford. He's a fourth generation Portuguese winemaker for his family's wine winery in Portugal's Panada Wines. And he kind of uh, held my hand through uh, making the wine in commercial amounts. Because I know for me, my experience of you making wine in our basement and one awful experience in our bedroom where red wine went everywhere, it's very different than making it for the masses. So can you talk about some of the challenges that you encountered when you went from making it in the basement to say the big screen? It's pretty much the same. Obviously we had to invest in a ton of equipment startup investment for something like this was huge, as you know. That was a scary part, yeah. more, than, more than making the wine. Um, Very different than healthcare, It's the for sure. same process, you just have to, if, if you make a mistake, it costs you a fortune. Yeah. So tell me about where you get your grapes from. Do you um, grow your own grapes? We don't grow any grapes. We um, buy grapes from Westport Rivers when they have some available. Um, in Westport, Mass. Uh, we buy some from Hazlitt Vineyards up in the Finger Lakes. And most of everything, certainly all the reds and um, the Sauvignon Blanc that we get is from uh, Lanza Family Vineyards in Susan Valley, California. We're looking forward to going up this January to uh, see what grapes will be available for us for next fall in 2019. That's always a fun trip. Mm -hmm. um, this one unexpectedly turned into a family trip. <laughs> that Can't wait. We went from two people going to 12 people going. So, you know, it's nice to have uh, wine in the, in the family business. So, you, do you produce a lot of wine here? How many, I don't even know how to ask, how many gallons of wine do you produce a year? Well, we started out with just a wine bar operating. So it was only probably two or 3,000 cases a year in the beginning. But now that we have the big event space and we're doing a ton of weddings here at the winery, um, we're probably doing more like 12,000 cases right now. And I would say it's gonna be 20,000 in the next couple of years because wow. it's just kink. And that's just for us. As you know, we don't really distribute. There's only a couple other places besides the bar and the winery that you can get our wine. and that's. Uh, Julio's in Westboro and the Boston Public Market. So you mentioned the wine bar. When did that open? Uh, I don't know. You 
you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> Were you four years ago now? Yeah, I would say, well, this is our third year, and um, that's pretty successful. We do some small events there, and rehearsal dinners, and bachelorette parties, and bridal showers, and things like that, but it took us, I would say, about an additional three years to get the winery up and running. Uh, where there were a lot of surprises that we encountered when we Well, the event space, the winery was up and running Correct. pretty much right away. But uh, yeah, the event space was a hassle. I think one of my favorite things about the event space is the 40-year-old Cab Sauv wine vines that Ron Lanza from Lanza Vineyards, where we get our grapes from out in Susan Valley, California, cut down and shipped across the country for us to turn that into our grand ballroom chandelier. That's pretty impressive. I really wanted to tie the wine into the history with the Cordage Rope Factory, and that was pretty important to me. What's one of your favorite features that came from the designing of the event space? I think the bar is pretty impressive. We what? have six wines on tap, which is kind of hard to find around here unless you go into Boston. Um, what types of wines are on tap? We rotate them, but there's always, you know, we try to keep three reds on tap at all times, and either three whites or two whites and a rosé. It depends on what we have available. Okay, and I presume that a lot of blood, sweat, and tears uh, made that happen, and having six wines on taps, it must be difficult to keep up with the demands and the weddings. It's, it's very hard to keep the weddings are going through like a hundred bottles of wine every wedding. When was your first wedding? April 7th of this year. Wow. So how many weddings have you done so far? I'm not sure the total amount. It's every weekend. Some weekends there's three. I, I know we have like 45 from the whole 2018. Wow. And there's only 52 weeks in a year. So we only opened April 7th, I'm trying to do the math in my head, and we booked over 45 weddings. So that means we had some really brave brides that gave us a non-refundable deposit a year in advance when this was an empty rope factory without bathrooms or without a kitchen? Yeah, well the contract says non-refundable, but I guarantee <laughs> if we weren't done, we would have been writing a lot of checks. I know it was a, a it, we came sliding into home plate sideways. I, I remember having to say to the contractors, put the paintbrushes down and step away from those hammers. We are done. And we got our occupancy permit exactly a week before that very first wedding. So that was harrowing, wasn't it? Yeah. I think that's what makes us different than most wineries, um, is that we really designed this place to be an event space. And we designed it you know, to, that's kind of our major thing. That's why we don't distribute. We're pretty much making boutique style wines for our own locations for the most part. And so, is it fair to say that this is open to the public? Can they do tastings here? I mean, I understand what's different is that you can have a wedding here, but can you also do a tasting here? You can. Um, most of the regular, like, $10 tastings, we try to filter down to the wine bar tasting room because you can walk in there, you don't need a reservation. Where is that located? Uh, 170 Water Street, to this waterfront on the harbor. Okay. About a mile down the road is where the winery and event space is in Cordage Park. So the tastings are there. You have to have a reservation for both um, a regular tasting or the premium experience that we call Vintner's Experience. What's that entail, a Vintner Experience? Uh, we try to kind of focus on those, and like I said, send the, the, the regular tastings down to the waterfront, because the Vintner Experience, they were done by me personally. Um, it's about a two hour event, and we bring them into the winery, and we take tastes out of the tanks, stainless steel tanks. Um, we show them the whole process of how wine is made, you know, like wine making 101, walk them through the bottling. Um, and they're pretty amazed because everything here is done by hand. They see Very by hand. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that. How it is, they're, they're usually quite surprised. We bring them in here into the barrel room. This is our small barrel room. It holds about 56 barrels of wine when it's completely full. 
Um, it's designed with uh, like a tin ceiling and a nice chandelier. That's because you can rent this out uh, for private dinners up to 12 people. And uh, when they do the weddings, they do a lot of photo ops in here with the bridal parties and stuff. Um, so we take them in here and we do barrel tastings. Uh, they get to taste a lot of wines that are for the cult members only. So, so tell me a little bit about that. Are you going to have a wine club? A wine cult, yeah. What's the difference between a wine cult and a wine club? Uh, well, we built it as usual. We do everything differently. <laughs> that, you can um, say that. I never that. got through with the vintner experience. So oh. let me finish that. I'll oh, I'm sorry. So as a typical wife, I interrupt. We take you. them in and we do barrel tastings in the barrel room so they get to taste a lot of different wines, a lot of different vintages at different stages in their life. And then we take them down into the bar and they have a beautiful table set up in front of the fireplace. We give them, uh, every individual gets a gourmet charcuterie board. Um, and then we go through all six wines on tap. And then um, we go through a bunch of dessert wines and port wine. So they drink a lot of wine for our business experience. <laughs> and like I said, it takes about two hours and it's really meant for people that are really into wine and really want to learn more about how it's made and to really get a good sampling of all the wines that we make here. Um, but going, now going back to the cult, instead of just, do, we didn't want to do a traditional wine club where everybody just gets two, three, four bottles of wine every quarter. Kind of gets repetitive with most wineries because most wineries only make so many wines, so you get the same wines over and over. So we decided since we have the wine bar, wine and tapas bar, and the winery and the event spaces at those locations, it would make more sense to do a cult where you pay an annual fee, I think it's $300 annually, and then you get discounts on all the events that are going on in both locations. You get discounts at the wine bar for wine and tapas and flights. You get free tastings every quarter for you and your friends. You get access to wines that we make only for the wine cult members. I think that's the most exciting part to me is having access to your really high-end wines. And for instance, I'm sure the camera can't see this, but we do have some uh, Jack Daniels uh, wine barrels here. They're retired whiskey barrels. And um, we have some vintages in there, some 2016 cabs, so that should be very exciting to um, offer to the wine cult, uh, wine cult members, so. Yeah, in this room, this little barrel room alone, we have um, a whiskey cab, like you said, we have a steak cab from our uh, lines of vineyards. Um, that means that all the cab came from one, one vineyard and there's nothing else mixed into it. That's going to be really good. I see a little Petit Verdot over your shoulder. Petit Verdot, Petit Syrah. We have an oaked um, Chardonnay up there. So there's a lot happening in this little barrel room. Those wines are only available to the cult members. We don't sell them uh, retail to anybody else. But they also get a bunch of discounts on other things. They get glasses and shirts and stuff like that too. It sounds like you have a lot going on at the 1620 Winery. You do. It keeps me busy. And it keeps me happy. And you know what they say, a happy wife is a happy life. Well, Robert, I'd like to thank you today for spending some time with not only me that you see every day, but with our visitors that are interested in winemaking. And we'd like to say to them, cheers. So, what are you going to so do? Bob, tell me a little bit about what's in this tank. Uh, this is a 2018 Riesling. It's a small batch just for cult members. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be a semi-sweet. We're pretty, um, our Riesling is a pretty popular wine, as you know. The Mayflower White. This is a different, different Riesling. It's not going to be quite as sweet for the cult members, more towards the drier end. And where did we get the grapes for the, this Riesling? Uh, this reason came from the Finger Lakes. Okay. And can we have a little sip of that? Yeah. All right. Oh, that's yummy. That looks delicious. 
All right, let's see. It has not been clarified yet. So yeah, talk to me a little bit about the color. What's going on in there? It's a little fuzzy. Right now we're letting it settle so that all of the leaves will go down to the bottom of the tank. Okay. And then we'll rack off the wine from here. The clear wine off the top, as you see, it's probably got a couple more weeks of sitting. And then mm. we'll clean out the dead leaves out of the, out of the bottom of the tank. And it sounds like you're saying dead leaves. Leaves. It's just the, the dead <laughs> yeast and, and pigment. I'm just trying to give us a little education. We're not saying leaves, we're saying leaves. That's brand new. It'll taste a lot different by the time. So that's probably like 18 months away from being bottled. Wow, that long? It tastes delicious already. The joys of being married. You can share a glass. Oh, you're sick. You're keeping that glass. <laughs> That is very good. That already. is really good already. So what do we have in this tank? We have a dry Pinot Grigio over here. Mm -hmm. We're not going to try them all, right? Right. Um, again, this is a 2018, and uh, it's got a long ways to go. Well, let's give it you a little see taste. see we're chilling it down. I'm going to grab another glass so it can have a little taste. So this is our chiller. All of these tanks are individually climate controlled. You can see the thermostats on the back. Glycol runs to each tank. So these are being cold stabilized right now, which means we chill them down to under 20 degrees. It gets, crystallizes all the tartrates. We let that sit for a couple of weeks. When we shut this down and open the tank up, all the crystals will be stuck to the sides of the tank. It'll look like a cave of stalagmites. So you want to give me a little, just a little pour? Okay, thank you. Oh, this is another one of those cloudy ones. So about how long do you think before this goes in the bottle? Same thing, about 18 months. 18 months, okay. Pinot Grigio. Grigio is good. Yum, delicious. Is it? Yes, it's fabulous. Okay, I'm glad I tasted first. I think you have a super palate. You taste better than I do. It's got a long way to go. <laughs> He's not shy no about more. telling the truth about his wine. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you to my guests and to you for joining us today. I'd love to know what your favorite wine is, so email me at raquel at 1620winery.com. You never know, we may feature your favorite on our next episode. Until then, cheers.